Hello and welcome to Sweet Spot DFS. This is a review for the 2021 Zozo Championship where Patrick Cantley is your winner. If you followed Chad Eckert on Twitter or actually just listened to the Fantasy Golf Pod, he was on Patrick Cantley. He was on the two Patricks. Cantley ended up doing a little bit better than Reed, obviously, being the winner. But Chad was basically on him because of his ties to California. And it worked out. Personally, I didn't have a lot of Cantley, and I'll talk about it in the spreadsheet coming up here. Uh, but in this review, basically, I'll do kind of a recap of the tournament because I got to see a little bit of it, not nearly the entire tournament. I think I missed most of Saturday, but I did get to see a good chunk of Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. So I'll kind of give my recap uh, of how I felt about that. And then we'll talk about a lot of the stuff I did in the strategy video. I only had one this last uh, this last week. And it encompassed basically the course fit, kind of went through stats. I incorporated a new section of the spreadsheet, just looking at all of last week's stats and kind of combine it with the last week bucket. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I think I'll just go bucket by bucket, see how well it did. There, There's a little something with that that I have to mention. Um, and we'll get we'll get to that at that point in time. So timestamps are in the description. You can certainly get to there uh, to those there, or you can use the chapter mode, which is the red progress bar on YouTube. If you go ahead, hover over that, or click and drag, you can get to any part of the video. It, it pops up. Those are where the timestamps are. So it's super nice uh, feature on YouTube. Go ahead and utilize it to your full advantage. Let's go ahead and get in the spreadsheet. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the results first. I did have the recent form tab up, but Patrick Cantlay won at 23 under. Now, I didn't say anything about what my target, what I thought the target score was going to be. 20 under seems to be pretty typical. There is something to be said, too, with perfect conditions, because that's exactly what these guys had throughout the entire week. Basically, perfect conditions. Not only were they at a country club where they manicure the golf course absolutely perfectly to begin with, but they really didn't have to battle any weather elements. So it wasn't very windy. Uh, I can't remember what the biggest wind day was. It could have been Saturday. It might have been Sunday. I don't really recall what the broadcast said. Um, but it was one of those two days. Thursday and Friday were just prime scoring conditions. So really... And and there wasn't one stack over another. So there wasn't like an AM PM stack or a PM AM stack. It was pretty even keel throughout the entire time, especially with a limited feel like this using holes one and ten, you know, going off of, of both of the holes. It people weren't on the golf course very long, or the golf course didn't have people on it for very long, I should say. So if I were to go back in time, I would have said target score would have been around twenty under. It looked like, you know, the the PGA Tour pros, they were just firing on all cylinders Thursday, Friday. It really looked like it could have been a 30 under winning score. But really, I think when it comes to Saturday and Sunday, Saturday, a lot of the top guys are trying to protect their their scores. They're not really going super low. Um, and then obviously on Sunday, usually your leaders are just trying to not lose the tournament more often than not. And in this tournament, Patrick Cantley was the guy coming from behind. Like he was, he had to make up a lot of ground in order to win this. So he was just full lights go all the way through hole 18. While it looked like Rom and JT kind of faltered a little bit because it seemed like they were trying to protect a lead. So I don't know what was going on there. I mean, obviously JT was firing on all cylinders most of the most of the tournament, but when it came down to Sunday, he had a lot of wayward shots that were just, I have no idea what caused him. Uh, it looked like, honestly, I, I picked Rom to begin with, and it looked like it was going to be Rom's week, but he also choked towards the end. I mean, there was a shot he tried to hit on 12, I think, whatever that par 5, the, the first par 5 on the back 9. Um, hole 11. So he tried hitting a draw into the the pin the pin position was on the on the front left or it was middle left but you wanted to hit a draw into uh Sunday's pin position and he just he he ended up 40 yards short so i have no idea if he mishit it didn't even look like he did he he looked like he was posing so i have no idea what happened there but he ended up making par when JT drove it into the crap 
and then had it hit a pretty decent second shot to get it over the green a little bit. Um, his tee shot hit the penalty. He found penalty on this tee shot. Second shot went over the green, chipped up, and one putted for a par. While Rom hit his drive in the middle of the fairway, hit an iron shot, a crappy one, into the bunker short left. Again, 40 yards short of the green. And then chunked that one out, had to chip up, missed his putt, par- and then made the putt for a bogey. Like, really, Rom should have won this tournament. And and tall, tall credit to JT. He should have won this one as well. But if there were... If we were to look between the two, Rom had most of his game going. Like it didn't look like he had any weaknesses happening. And even that one shot that I was just telling you about on hole 11, it didn't look like a terrible shot. And then Rom just followed up by well, I think he followed that hole <clears throat> that hole up with another bogey. But really he he wasn't missing nearly the same as JT. JT was just it looked bad. Um but either way, Patrick Cantlay held his ground. Well, first of all, he surged up the leaderboard and then held his ground again, primarily because he was all lights or all systems go the entire round um, and finished out very strong. So kudos to Patrick Cantlay in his post game uh, interview. He talked a lot about how comfortable he was there. He even talked about how the overcast weather was perfect for him. He's like, this is that this was I absolutely didn't say absolutely. He's like, I love this weather. I love overcast. I know some people really don't, but that's that's kind of what I like. So I don't know if it's something to think about going further. Probably not. Uh, but, I mean, if we don't have sunny days and Cantlay's playing in California, why not? You know, like, I don't know. It, it seemed, I mean, it, by the way, I have to mention this too. Cantlay was hitting fades into holes where typically you don't really see him hit fades. He primarily hits a draw, but he was hitting fades into the into the holes and they were they were really nice. Like they were crisp. So, something to take note of. If he's really shaping his shots, um and he's got really good control, which it looked like on Sunday, watch out. He's a good pick for the Masters. Okay. So, that was kind of my recap of the tournament. I I saw most of it Sunday, so that's kind of what um, we're going to go with there. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the spreadsheet. We typically always start with the recent form tab. So I now I have this this podcast on audio only, so I'm going going I'm going to explain it for them. Here, I typically like to look at the $1 short game winning lineup versus the optimal lineup. So the $1 short game winning lineup scored a total of 748 points. It used up all $50,000 of salary. So we haven't really been seeing all 50,000 win at GPP lately, but this one obviously did. And believe it or not, it scored, so 748 Optimal lineup scored 756.5 points. That is a difference of eight and a half points. It was really close. So spending all your money, you know, a lot of people say during these limited events, you will gain leverage by leaving a lot of money on the table. Well, guess what? In order to win this tournament, you needed to use all of your money. So that leverage thing, by the way, most people... When they say that kind of stuff, it's more of a gut thing. It isn't more of an analysis thing. They're not looking at previous tournaments and making that type of analysis to provide you. So although they talk about it as that being a smart thing to do, there's no backing to it. There's no data that backs it. Every week during these review videos, I go over the the winning lineup for the GPP. And then I go over the optimal. So you can see the differences in prices, um, or I should say salary used. So the optimal lineup, again, scored 756.5 points. It used up 49,800. So this is the optimal lineup, $200 away from using max salary. It, I think it was pretty easy to get there. And the $1 short game winning lineup was Patrick Cantley, Justin Thomas, Ryan Palmer, Bubba Watson, Lanto Griffin and Sebastian Munoz. 
for my YouTube viewers, that's everyone that's highlighted in blue. The little black tick marks here are the optimal lineup guys, and that includes Patrick Cantlay, Justin Thomas, Ryan Palmer, Russell Henley, Cameron Smith, and Sebastian Munoz. So, Munoz was 14th place. Now, let me actually go back a little bit. The $1 short game winning lineup just missed out. They used Bubba Watson and Alonto Griffin. They were not a part of the optimal lineup. Russell Henley and Cameron Smith were. Uh, and that's who the $1 short game winning lineup guy missed out on. But, obviously, he won. Uh, I think he tied for first, actually. But... It's really interesting to kind of do this analysis because I always want to find as many people in the top 10 as possible. Obviously, it works out this week. One guy finished 14th, scored 116 and a half points. Uh, everybody who was 10th place and above scored 105 and a half points or more. Um, but you have a bunch of guys here that are after 10th place that scored more. So sticking to just all 10th place finishes, not necessarily... Um, the route to go, but it's also simpler because we don't have DK points that we can go back to 2013. Obviously, we can do those types of uh, calculations, looking by hole by hole, tournament by tournament. Over time, I think I can get there, but at this present moment, it's not it's not easy to do that. So I will always be looking at top 10 results. And really, if you did look at top 10 results, you could put up a decent lineup. I mean, you could have scored four and a half points less if you went from Sebastian Munoz to Cameron Champ. Uh, so it would have worked out regardless if you, you know, went all top 10 guys or not. Either way, that is your optimal lineup versus $1 short game winning lineup. Very close. Uh, the winner, pretty spot on. So let's go into something. Actually, let's talk about the bucket system. Uh, I actually want to go to the 2021 DK page first. So the bucket system, if you guys follow me during the review video, I highlight names with two bucket numbers, basically. The first bucket number you see is the last year bucket, and that's always one through six, numbers one through six, one being best, six being worse. Then the second bucket number is the last week bucket, and that is, again, one through six, one being best, six being worse. Um. As you can see on the spreadsheet for my YouTube viewers, you have nothing but last week bucket twos up there. Not not all, but mo the majority of top 10 golfers are last week bucket twos. If I go to the bucket system where I hold the uh, the bucket system page, I should, I should, hold on. The notes page, which houses the bucket system, you can find in those on YouTube, you can see this, the number one bucket should have been what I deemed as the last week bucket two. And the reason I deem this to be the last week bucket two is in these no cut limited field events, the majority that we see are dominated by golfers who did not play the week before. And further going down on that list, I created a last year bucket as well as a last week bucket of all the limited fields that are played on the PGA Tour. So CJ Cup being one of them, WGC Bridgestone when it was around, WGC, WGC Mexico, WGC HSBC, and then the WGC St. Jude, uh, the FedEx St. Jude Invitational. So all five of those tournaments, I calculated for as long as they were limited field events. And I say that because the St. Jude tournament wasn't always uh a limited field that was a full cut event at one point in time full field with a cut i should say and it obviously turned into a limited field no cut event um two years ago so that's why the data if you're looking on youtube is a little smaller than the other ones also with the cj cup it's the same thing um so either way what i'm trying to get at is when i calculated the last week bucket the last week buckets I did it primarily based off of the analysis of all of those tournaments, not of the Zozo from last year. Last year's tournament saw a lot of golfers play the week before, and those that finished inside the top 20 of the week before did really well at this tournament. 
same thing happened with this tournament. Um, if I were to go ahead, let me hide this information. And I'm going to also hide this information. I mean, you guys can see on, uh, yeah, I'm going to hide this. I, it's, it's not important. But what I want to get at is, here's where I have the last week scores. So these are scores from last week. Of, let's see, 11, no, 10 golfers. Of 10 golfers, we had, trying to do it like quickly, six golfers. So six out of 10 golfers finished top 20 the week before. Had I just gone with these numbers here from last year, it would have been pretty easy. We, we could have, it would have changed a lot of things. Uh, and I will further explain that in in this this video in this podcast but yeah it's it's really disappointing because you can see all of the last week twos that i have, have up here jt was the last week two so it was rom ryan palmer bubba watson russell henley cameron smith they were all last week twos they literally should have been last week ones uh and that was primarily again talking about last year's zozo championship where we saw a large majority of golfers finish inside the top 10 had a top 20 finish the week before. So unfortunately I didn't go that route. I went with a comprehensive analysis over all of the la the limited field events. Uh, and it's kind of a little disappointing, honestly, because I think it could have been an easy week to take advantage of the bucket system. Uh, despite there only being one year's worth of data that we can go off of. So either way, the other thing I want to talk about, how well the last year bucket did. So the, again, the last year bucket is using that all encompassing, the comprehensive analysis of all of the limited field events. So it, it works out for that. The last week bucket, as I'm starting to realize, and I kind of already knew this already, but every tournament is unique to the last week bucket. Most of the time, the last year bucket is it kind of falls pretty closely to what each week is. So that's more of a universal, like that we can almost use that as a universal um, bucket because a lot of golfers who finish in the top 20 the week before fall under that bucket. Same with those who didn't play, whatever. It's much easier doing it that way. So like, I guess a different way to say this is the last week bucket could be, you could use, it's like a one size fits most. That's a perfect way to put it. The last week bucket is unique to the tournament. So it's it's best to analyze every tournament differently by the last week. Whatever it shows in the bucket system, that's how we should go with. So either way, that's kind of what I saw uh, or what I see from this. It was really close, but I mean, the last week, the last year bucket hit. We have nothing but ones and twos inside the top 10. There is a last year four, which is Bubba. Uh, and there's a last year five, which is Joel Damon. But uh, uh, those two golfers, not included, a lot of them were ones and twos. And really, if I open this back up so we can see who the optimal lineup was, you have Patrick Cantley, who was a 1-3. Justin Thomas, who was a 2-2, two -two, which should be a 2-1. You know, again, if we're flipping those buckets. Uh, Palmer was a 2-2. Two -two. He should be a 2-1. Bubba, uh, he's not in the optimal. Russell Henley was a 1-2, should be a 1-1. Cameron Smith was a 1-2, he should be a 1-1. And then Sebastian Munoz was a 1-2, he should be a 1-1. So again, like, using the bucket system, it would have been amazing had we flipped those and, and paid more attention to the last, uh, last week ones. So, super interesting to think of it that way. I want to go really... I don't really so much really quickly want to, but a new segment that I included with my DK strategy page or video podcast is looking at strictly last week stats. And I'm going to incorporate this with the last week bucket. So we're going to be able to really determine how last week buckets with stats work out. So I'm going to go really quickly throughout. Well, I'm going to try to go quickly. I don't know if I can or not, but we're going to look at each last week bucket by itself 
with the last week's stats. I think this is the best way to analyze this. So let's go ahead and look at the last week bucket ones. And I wanted to go through that last segment to explain this because obviously we're going to see last week buckets up here. The last week bucket ones I deemed as the did not plays, uh, which obviously we're not going to have last week scoring for because they didn't play last week. Um, this would be best to look with all around stats or even recent form stats, which I'm eventually going to get to. But you can see what I have this sorted by result from top to bottom. Um, a lot of these, again, this should be the last week bucket two golfers. Like this is the pool of last week bucket twos. So they should be. Um, and three of them finish inside the top 20, all of them being the expensive golfers. So this would have been kind of really easy to pinpoint because look at the rest of the golfers. They're all seven or they're 6K and below basically, or I should say 6,300. Let me sort it by salary. So you would have Webb Simpson at 9,700, Patrick Reed at 96, Tony Finau at 95, Tiger at nine, Phil at 7.5, and then everyone else is 6,300 and below. And guess what? All those 6,300 and below, not even worth a play. So if we were looking at these golfers here, the five that aren't 63 and below, you had Webb, Reed, Finau, Woods, Mickelson. If I were to tell you you needed to pick two golfers out of that, I think it would be pretty easy for you to you know, make a pretty decent lineup. At least you can fade a lot of those guys together. And in all honesty, you would have wanted to fade everybody because... None of them finished inside the op. No one were. No one was inside the optimal lineup, and nobody was also. They weren't a part of the one dollar short game GPP. So something to take uh, account for that. But let's go ahead. Skip last week bucket one again. Should be last week bucket two, but I made that mistake. Uh, so let's get into the last week bucket twos. Um, so these are golfers who finished top twenty the week before. You can see that on the screen. Everybody. Top to bottom, one through 17th place. Uh, and we had <clears throat> 18 golfers in this bucket. Now, if we go back to the bucket system and look at the top 10 from last year, seven of our top 10 golfers fell under this bucket. Seven. Now, I can also go up here and look at top five finishes, two ended up finishing top five. So when we go back and look at this last week bucket, uh, and if I were to go by DK points, well, actually, let's go by result. We actually had six golfers finish inside the top five. Six. And many of them were, uh, were in the optimal lineup. Now, those six also turn out to be 10, the top 10 as well. So the top five and top 10 buckets are going to look the same. For the last week, that is. Um, but let's go ahead and look at the salary top to bottom. Uh, Xander Shoffley was your top guy and for salary. He finished 17th place. He scratched and clawed his way back up to 17th place. He was doing really terrible on Friday and Saturday. Um, but when we look at the rest of the guys, John Rom JT. Like, I was really on Rom, and a lot of it had to do because I liked him the best out of this pool of golfers. Not to say I didn't like JT. Like, that's not me saying I don't like JT, but my convictions were with Rom. And Rom scored 80. Oh, I'm sorry. Then we're not looking. Uh, Rom scored 130 points for this week. He scored 133 last week. What's really funny is. JT outscored Rom last week also by three points. Now JT score outscored him this week by three and a half points, but really weird to see that kind of correlation right there. That's that's amazing. It's interesting. Xander scored over 100 points yet again. So honestly, Xander scoring over 108 didn't do terrible. You know, I don't think you could make a lot of money rostering Xander at his roster spot. Maybe you could, maybe you can't. Uh, I didn't really look into it, and I don't think I want to for this recap. Uh, but, anyways, let's go ahead, go a little bit further. And I don't want, I don't want to stay on on what I was just talking about. Um, I want to go kind of left to right with these 
So DK points, your top scorer was Jason Kokrak last week, followed by Xander. And then Tyrrell Hatton, Russell Henley was your fourth scoring guy from last week inside this last week bucket two uh, pool of golfers. So I want to clarify that. We're only looking at these 18 golfers, which are considered in the last week bucket two. So this is a pool of golfers inside the last week bucket two. We're looking at DK points from last week, and it's top to bottom. So Kokrak, Xander, Tyrrell Hatton, Russell Henley. Henley finished third last week with 118 points, or 112 and a half points. He's finished fourth this week with 116. So really riding out that form, uh, it would have been really, uh, I mean, we, if, I didn't I didn't I didn't roster a lot of Russell Henley. I should have. He was the 16th ranked guy in the in the uh S the sweet spot rank. And in this bucket, he was the second ranked guy. Man, that hurts. <laughs> that hurts a lot. And also, this SS rank is largely dependent on both the last year bucket and last week bucket. Again, these should be last week bucket ones. So I don't want to confuse everybody by continuously talking about, you know, jargon that you might not understand or know just yet. But again, the lower the number, the better. So we want them to be ones. These guys should have been ones. But I made the mistake in basically giving them the wrong number based off of my analysis. So... Again, these guys should be lower numbers, which would have really increased their ranks. Um, but I feel kind of stupid not playing a lot of Henley. Uh, a lot of me just felt like he can't do it again. Um, but really, everybody in this bucket, oh my god, Like I almost feel sick not playing any of these guys. Like You can get your really low-priced guys right here inside the top six of from the sweet spot rank down obviously i had rom high and rom would have been high no matter what uh and i don't think it would have been terrible if you would have rostered him over jt uh but jt would have given you 400 dollars more to play with uh and maybe that makes a difference but you could have easily went rom henley cameron smith even sebastian munoz and ryan palmer like no sweat that would have been really easy to roster those guys. What would you have left? You would have had $9,400 to play with. Now, that could screw you up. That might not get you on the right guy, honestly. But $9,400, you know, I don't know. That's insane. Just looking at this ranked bucket, that's that's crazy. Anyways, um, I don't want to stay too far too long on that. It's just really interesting. So... Again, SS rank, that's kind of what we're going by. But we were, we were first talking about DK points. And seeing the correlation between last week and this week is pretty amazing. Now, Taylor Gooch didn't do that well. Uh, neither did Tyrrell Hatton. But again, I wasn't really expecting Hatton to do well. I also wasn't expecting Kokrak to do well. But obviously, Kokrak did. Um, And I also wasn't really expecting Bubba to play well again either. So... If we go ahead, let's see, what do I want to hide? Yeah, we'll just leave it like this. It's fine. Um, wow. Um, never mind. I, I was just looking at these numbers. I forgot how I, how I sorted this. I sorted it by DK points. Uh, but let's go ahead and just sort it by result, right? Is that how we want to do this? Nah, we're go we're gonna go left to right and we're gonna sort it all by the same. So scoring average, your best scoring average last week obviously was Kokrak, Xander. I think we already know our results, right? I mean, if we just look at the DK points, Henley was really the only one. Henley and, and Bubba from last week were really the only ones to look into this. So when it comes when it comes to scoring average, low round, all that stuff, that's pretty simple to look at. Um because it all just matches up, you know, with DK points. It all just, it all goes together. But really the things that we probably want to look at are T to green, you know, top to bottom. So your top guy last week was Bubba. 
10.99 tee to green. He had negative putting stats. In fact, why don't we do this? Let's just go straight by putting right away. No, 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 no. What I want to do is filter this out and let's go less than and equal to 0.5. I think that's that's decent. Let me know in the in the chat if you think it should be zero. Because a lot of people want negative um putting stats, and I don't really think negative putting stats is really the way to go. Uh, I do think having a little bit of a positive and going low would be the way to do it. But here you go. All of your negative putting stat guys in this bucket from last week, you have four out of six golfers finish inside the top five. Like there are only six guys in this range and four of them finish top five. So why don't we go ahead and... Let me just list them out to you. So the two guys who didn't finish top five are Mark Hubbard and Colin Morikawa. Um, really surprised about Morikawa's performance this week. He finished 50th. But I really liked Mark Mark Hubbard. I thought this was a good course fit for him. Um, negative putting stats this week or last week. He had decent tee to green, not the greatest. But I think, oh my gosh. Of these guys, if you follow me on Twitter, I know I'm kind of bouncing right now, but if you followed me on Twitter, I had posted, because I'm starting to keep track of strokes gained uh, round by round, had, or I mean, if you followed me on Twitter, you would have seen me tweet out, you know, the winning showdown lineups for each week or for each uh, round. And... I, the first, uh, sh after showdown two, I think it was, maybe it was after one, I had said, looks like you don't need all negative putters, you know, because a lot of people, the the main strategy for showdown is looking at golfers who were good tee to green, but terrible strokes game putting, you know, for the previous round and just trying to hammer down on those. Well, it was like an even mix of three and three, of three negative putters and then three positive putters. None of the positive putters being like absolutely good positive putters, but still above zero. Um, zero being average, obviously, in the field. So um, the one thing I did notice, a lot of the golfers that did finish or that were in the winning lineup had positive off the tee. And I have a theory about that. So one of the reasons why... I like how I do these fantasy golf stuff is I'm a player, you know, I'm a competitive player. I'm thinking about why, you know, certain golf courses are good for certain golfers. You know, I'm thinking about my competitive mindset off the tee provides the most confidence. Now you could argue and say putting does, but I, I would disagree. Putting is more of a disappointment. You know, like if you miss a five footer, it's like, really? Come on. If you snake a 30 footer, you're like, that's right. I knew how this was going to go in. Like, you're not really thinking I'm going to make every single putt. A lot of the times when it comes to putting, if you're on a streak, you're like, oh God, I hope I don't miss this one. Now, some people are, have different mindsets, but for the most part, it's, it's more or less, you know, can I keep the streak going? Whereas off the tee, if you're free swinging and you're finding fairways, there isn't anything more confident. Like it doesn't add, it's just so good. Just think about it. If you're hitting the ball really well off the tee, every time you go up and you tee it down, you really don't have that worry that the ball's gonna go wayward. Now sure, you might lose your focus for a little bit and you do go wayward, the next tee shot, though, you're more likely not going to. You're going to get right back into focus of things because you've just been swinging good the entire week. So I'm going to include that when I'm doing my analysis of, of showdowns. But also for this, look at the off the tee numbers. You know, Justin Thomas, 0.97. That was probably his worst off the tee performance and might be worth something to look at going forward. I don't know what his off the tee stats were. I should have included it. Um, for this week, but um, now that I think of it, I didn't, I haven't recorded round four stats yet. 
Um, it would be interesting to look at. But needless to say, off the T stats for those top four guys in this, you know, of the negative putters from last week's last week, I'm sorry, last week's uh, golfers in the last week bucket two for this tournament. That's a mouthful. I had to figure out how to say that easier. Um, it 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 proves that off the tee is is one of those good stats to look at. Okay, that was kind of long. Uh, a lot of data to really go through, and I don't know exactly how long I should be looking into this data, but I thought that was really interesting um, to look at that information. Another interesting thing too is how well these guys were around the green last week. Now, I'm guessing a lot of these guys having negative putting stats, it just makes sense that they'd be really good around the green. Same with Henley having negative around the green stats. He was really good with putting. So maybe it kind of goes hand in hand. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but super interesting nonetheless. All right, let's go ahead and look at last week threes. Um, I don't want to stay too long there. Now, this bucket had 17 golfers in it. Four or two of which finished inside the top 10, four finished inside the top 20. This is where Patrick Cantley resides in. He was in this bucket. Uh, I can tell you right now, the scoring average did not look good for them. And these are golfers who finished 20th to 40th last week. Uh, or I should say 21st to 40th last week. Um, I guess we can... Yeah, I'm trying to look at see if anything in the scoring department dk points scoring average i should really just say round average but scoring average low round rounds under 70 in their percentage did not look good you know for the top guys so i don't think it's really something to look at there but we can look here and try to figure out why some of these guys did well or really just the top two guys um i mean that's not even the right way to look at it because if I'm going to go off the tee and then try to find our negative putters, you know, like Rory's at the top 6.13 off the tee last week and then one positive 1.58. So maybe that's a reason not to like him. I mean, his approach was awful last week. And that's another thing too, like approach. If you can't hit your, you, if you can't give yourself good birdie opportunities, uh, it's that also hurts the confidence. So negative approach stats probably also something to look at. Um, but let's see our positive. Let's go ahead and look at our positive off the T and negative putters. Man, I don't know. I'm going to really do this, but I think I can go like this and it would be easy to follow. Okay, so right away, Danny Lee, Adam Hadwin, those guys don't fit the mold. Neither does Hideki Matsuyama. Um, you know, and like Danny Lee and Adam Hadwin had good off the tee stats last week. So didn't really work for the last week bucket three. In a way, what I'm trying to do when I'm analyzing this is I'm trying to find something that is pretty standard, you know, for each bucket. Because that would be amazing, wouldn't it? If we could find something that just stands out for each bucket and trying to find the optimal lineup. I mean, I, I feel like this is one of the pieces yet to be discovered is comparing last week's results with their, I mean, like their score with their strokes gained and then seeing what it looks like going into the next week. So I, I feel like there's a hidden gem somewhere in here. Um, but we do have varying results. And honestly, you know, looking at the top two guys, Cantley and Damon, they almost couldn't be opposites. There isn't one thing to look at for each of, you know, either of them. Cantley had really good off the tee stats. Damon did not. I mean, Damon was very, he was very even keeled throughout all of his stats. He and Cantley from last week gained the same amount of strokes, total that is, but they did it in very different ways. Like Cantley was minus 2.63 approach, minus 3.11 strokes game putting. D 
Damon was 1.56 approach, so there was like a three-stroke three, uh, three stroke swing, or four, almost. Eh, two, one. Yeah, three. Where is that? Is that? 2.63 to 1.56. Two is 2.63. Three is 0.6. Yeah, it's actually four strokes. So four-stroke difference there, and then putting, it's three. So... I, I don't think there's really anything that we can tell from this week's tournament that would determine that. Um, not even rounds under 70. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think... I really don't know. I mean, Rory McIlroy scored more points than Joel Damon. And he fits the same mold as Cantlay, minus the putting. But it's pretty much the same. Off the tee, both guys were positive, looked good. Um, even Berger. So maybe it is off. I think it might be off the tee and, and negative putting, honestly. It it could be something like that. And if we do that each week, let's go ahead and see what last week fours are all about. See if that has the same the same weight, the same merit. So we'll go by DK points, which already is. Um and oh my god so this range would be golfers who finished between 60 and 80th place 61 and 80th place um i could see this bucket changing a little bit it could go a little bit lower or it could go down to fives i'm not i'm not positive but it does not look like off the tee and negative everybody except for andrew landry is positive or negative andrew landry and dylan fratelli those are the only two golfers that were positive off the tee and negative putting. Everybody else was negative off the tee. I'm sorry, Nick Taylor is a part of that group as well. Um, so Corey Connors scored the most points in this bucket. He had 109.5. His tee to green game was minus 4.98 last week. 0.87 off the tee. That's minus 0.87, and then minus 1.88 approach. He's negative in every stat category. So really, it might just be coming down to looking at course fit, because when it looks at stats, it doesn't add up. And Norin was second in DK points, and he was worse. He was minus 16.21 strokes gain T degree. You can't get worse than that, really, um, of someone of his caliber. But his off the tee was bad. His approach was bad. Around the green was terrible. There probably needs to be more of an investigation as to why his numbers were like that. Um, I'm not sure. But then Fratelli was third, and he follows that same description that we were kind of talking about with off the tee with negative putting. So, I don't know. Let's see what uh, our last week fives look like. Um, trying to see if I see anything with you know, the lowest round of the golfers last week to, in correlation with their, um, I guess, the results this week. I think this bucket will probably be moved to the last week bucket fours because that's usually what this finishing position range ends up being for each tournament. So that would be 41st to 60th place fall under this bucket. Um, so obviously DK points from last week were better. Same with scoring average. Uh, rounds under 70 and not so much same with their percentage but i guess let's see can we see negative putting we see that from everybody of the top seven out of this i'm sorry this pool only consists of 12 golfers and seven of the 12 have negative putting stats that are up here and four of the seven have positive off the tee justin rose doesn't uh, and he scored 104.5 points. Kevin Kisner doesn't. He was at minus 0.19. So he was close. Uh, Kevin Na doesn't fit that mold either. He was minus 0.74. So very close to even, almost positive. But Carlos Ortiz, Byung-Hun Ann, Scotty Scheffler, all positive off the tee last week with negative putting stats. Most of them scored around 98 points. Uh, I shouldn't say most. So Scotty Scheffler scored 98.5 Ben Ann, 95.5, and Carlos Ortiz at 90.5. 
Um, not terrible, you know, numbers for DK points, but you did want to get somewhere around 100 with all of your guys. Scheffler could have really provided that, but um, obviously didn't. But if we were only looking for one of these golfers, you know, it would just be who was your favorite out of these guys. And if you did go by off the tee versus putting, you could have easily got on Cameron Champ, who scored you 112 points. And that would have been a, a decent substitute for one of the guys in the optimal lineup that was around 7K. You still would have beat the $1 short game GPP. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to conclude the last week analysis because uh, Jason Day brings up the last week's sixes. He finished 60th place. That's why this bucket system works. Like... I know he withdrew last week, and that's why he falls under that bucket. But for the most part, either way, it just works. Like, the last week bucket just highlighted that. So, really, of golfers inside the top 10 of DK scoring, like Tony Finau doesn't have stats because he didn't play last week. Um, but out of all of them, only one golfer did not have positive off the T stats, and that was Cameron Smith at minus 0.96. Of these golfers, there were only one, two, three, four, so four out of nine golfers did not have negative putting stats. And that would be Ryan Palmer, um, <clears throat> Sebastian Munoz, Russell Henley, and Cameron Smith. Now, Cameron Smith did the opposite. He has negative off the tee, positive putting. <clears throat> wow, excuse me. Henley was really the only one that was a little different. You know, like he, his putting was off the charts last week, and I'm, um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was off the charts this week as well. He's just feeling it with the putter. So um, interesting to look further into that. But that was the last week's stats, so... Video is already running long, or the, the pod is already running long. We'll finish this up looking at the DK points. Uh, one thing to note, like we'll go left to right. Um, I like to consider tee time pairings. So really, it's the golfers. It, you can see some of the highlighted numbers. Now, these highlighted numbers are based off of... Okay. Red means... I, actually, if they're highlighted... It's because their scoring average was below the field average. That's why they're highlighted. Now, if they're only highlighted with the red color, it's because they're the only person in their group to have that, uh, that scoring average below field average. If it's yellow, that means two. And if it's green, that means three. Three people in their original playing group. So that's the Thursday, Friday rounds. Um, and as I look at this, really only one grouping actually worked out and that was tony finau and cory connors cory connors is not highlighted but finau is with a red color so he was the only one in the group that had a a scoring average less than the field average um looking at the rest of these guys we don't see any other pairings that are up here that match with each other uh, i know if you're looking at it on youtube you can see john rom and justin rose all show up on the first page this is your top 20 right here um you can also see McElroy and simpson but they're at the bottom of this leaderboard and at their price you would not have wanted to play them i'm sorry cameron champ and bubba watson are also up there so it's cameron champ bubba watson they finished inside the top 10 so that pairing together would have been pretty fruitful then you would have had Corey connors and tony finau Probably don't really. It's not terrible. I mean, Finau's points is 111. Connors is 109.5. Uh, so really, you could have paired those guys up together, and that would have been pretty decent. Uh, but there really isn't any other pairings. That, there aren't any other pairings up here to talk about. Uh, so we can we can move on from there. And I actually, yeah, I'll actually freeze it right here so we can go through, look at the rest of the. Um, information patrick Cantley. i mean here's the ownership you guys can see it on the screen uh for my listeners really everyone seemed i wouldn't say chalky but patrick Cantley was only owned in 7.69 percent of the one dollar short game gpp um jt was next uh well i'm going top to bottom for dk points 
So JT, um, I'm not going top to bottom. I'm going by placement. Let's go top to bottom DK points. Patrick Cantley at 7.69. JT at 21.25. Ryan Palmer at 12.26. That's a pretty high ownership for someone at $7,100. Uh, Rom, 130 points. He was at 18.64%. Bubba Watson was only owned in nearly 10%, and he scored 116.5. Munoz was very popular at 7,200, 18.13%. Henley was 15.64% owned. Um, again, that's pretty popular in the AK range. Uh, and Cameron Smith, believe it or not, 14.19% owned at 7,200. So a lot of people hit. Like they uh, look like a lot of people went by last week form, and it's no surprise. It doesn't make it makes perfect sense to me. As to why you do that. I have some other pieces of, of information here. Round average. We won't talk about that. Um, it's just their average over the four rounds that they played. Obviously, when we look top to bottom, it's going to make a lot of sense. You know, why the, the higher DK scores are, you know, have lower rounds. So on and so forth. Uh, we really don't have to talk about tournament history because that just matches the last week or the last year score that is. Recent form average is something to, to look into, though. If I sort by this and we look top to bottom, we actually see a lot of guys finish inside the top 20. You, get, you can see that on the screen. Uh, for the listeners, of the top 20 guys, we really only have, what is this, four, five, six golfers who didn't finish inside the top 20 this week that were the top of the recent form. So this is just sorting from best recent form down to the bottom. Uh, again, six golfers out of 20 did not finish top 20. So recent form coming in this tournament really mattered. Looking at scoring average, um, it would have got you on certain guys like Justin Thomas, John Rom, Patrick Cantlay, but that's it. You know, it would have been those golfers, and you would have to have picked between Rom or JT. You wouldn't have really put those two together with Patrick Cantlay. So scoring average, and this was throughout – all of last year's scoring average, it's not included. It doesn't include this um, uh, this year's scoring average. So I know that has to be updated, but in time, definitely in time. Differential is just their scoring potential. So the higher the differential, the better scoring opportunities they have uh, or the better opportunity they can go really low. You don't see anyone really inside the top 10. Um, you see Ryan Palmer at the bottom here and John Rom, And those are the only two guys that are worth mentioning. So that really didn't hit. That didn't play. The number of rounds under 70 with the percentage of rounds under 70. It's not terrible. I mean, you've got the winner. You've got the two second places. But of the guys in the top 10, that's it. So that really didn't hit either. Not looking at that. Overall bent. We have John Rom at the top. He is the top overall bent grass golfer in the field and he finished second place. Uh, we do have JT and Patrick Cantlay up there inside the top 20. So we could find three golfers yet again, had to choose between uh, Rom and JT. So that's pretty challenging, pretty difficult. And I guess far to rank by, you know, just the result, looking at everybody at the inside the top 20, none of them, 0% of these golfers had a 0% top 10 bet percentage, which means of all of their all of their rounds played on bent grass golf courses, absolutely nobody, I should say, how do I word this? Everyone had at least one top 10. Um, and that's that's interesting and important to talk about because if we were to go ahead and just look at all the golfers that have 0%, which... There aren't many, but none of them finish inside the top 20. So that's, a, that's an important um, thing to, to mention. But once we go past there, um, I mean, maybe this is just how you X out these guys. Like one surprising name, maybe two, Harry Higgs. Second guy was Tyler Duncan. Neither one of them have a top 10 finish on bent grass golf courses. So that's super interesting. Um, we do see an eighth place finish of the bottom 20. You know, if we were thinking of top 10 bent percentage, the bottom 20 guys um, are 6% and below, basically. 
Cameron Champ finished eighth, and he's the only guy out of those golfers that really, you know, had a super good finish. Dylan Fratelli he finished eleventh. He's also in in the mix, but he wouldn't have. I don't think he would have won a lot of money if you had Fratelli in your lineup versus um, Cameron Champ. But I could be wrong. I mean, Fratelli was sixty three hundred. So actually, what what was his DK points? He scored. 99 and a half points and champ scored 112 so i think the 12 points do matter quite a bit looking at the top or i should say the 2020 bent grass averages xander shoffley was your top guy but then followed by jt john rom you also have cantley up there Corey connors is up there as well so maybe that's something to look at but overall looking at bent grass uh golfers going by average finishing position wasn't really the absolute um best way to go about this um so something to think about to consider but for the most part not something to totally go on uh and usually that's how it is week in week out so the next part i'm just gonna go through this really quickly those watching on youtube i recommend just pausing it however for those listening i'll give you a couple names i'll just go through we're gonna go strokes gained T to green, and we're going to go left to right on the stats I go through. So we're going to talk about T to green, off the T, approach, around the green, putting, green and reg, proximity, birdie or better. And all I'm going to do is highlight how many guys finish inside the top 10 by sorting this, you know, from top to bottom. And so I'm only going to be looking at the top 20 golfers. So I'm going to let you know of those top 20 golfers for each of these stats, which one finished inside the top 10 or how many finished inside the top 10. Because again, the... The reason I do it this way, when you hear certain people in the industry say, we really want to be targeting guys, you know, hitting off the tee, or we want to target guys that are best in tee to green. That's why we come here and do this analysis, because I can tell you, you don't want to pick all six golfers, you know, that have good tee to green, where most of these people who are giving the advice to say target tee to green golfers if they're not giving you a precise number of how many to target, you're more than likely probably going to pick the top guys, right? How I, I don't know how many of you are going, well, I think it's kind of silly to pick you know, the top TD Green guys because usually week in, week out, that doesn't work out. But in case you aren't one of those people, here's proof. Okay, so top TD Green. This is your top 20. Uh, it's from Tony Finau down to Joaquin Neiman. You know, when we're looking on the screen. We have Bubba Watson, John Rahm, JT, Russell Henley as the only golfers. So 4 out of 20 golfers, tops of tee to green, finished inside the top 10. So tee to green, not terrible. How about off the tee? We have Rahm, Bubba Watson, Cameron Champ, and Corey Connors. So we have four off the tee. So we can already see what we what do we have? Bubba and John Rom kind of overlapping there, right? Just trying to remember. Yeah, we didn't have Cam- Cameron Champ. Um, so Bubba and Rom overlapping. That might be good enough already. When we look at approach, we see Bubba once again, followed by Russell Henley, JT, and Cameron Champ. So we're already seeing a ton of overlap with some of these guys now. You could look at the rest of the other golfers and you probably see overlap as, as well. You're going to see top 20 stats with a lot of these guys. Uh, I'm guessing, I mean, we would have saw Morikawa twice, more than likely. Same with Matthew Fitzpatrick, I think, right? Yeah, Fitzpatrick would be up here. Um, so either way, you're going to see a lot of overlap. But I guess in a way, maybe what I could say is if you do see overlap, pick certain golfers out of that. You know, don't pick all six of them. Pick three or four, but not all six. Uh, around the green, we had JT. Patrick Cantlay, his first time finished, you know, f- um, showing up in the top 20 stats out of any of these. Um, but then you have Bubba Watson and Cameron Smith once again. So, again, Bubba, just the top stat guy, uh, maybe worth the play, or should have been worth the play. Now, if we look at putting, putting is kind of a little bit more difficult. This should be mostly maybe looking at last week's results. And maybe we'll go back to last week page and and try to figure this out. But looking at last week, um, 
when it comes to top to bottom putting, we have Russell Henley, Cameron Smith, and Justin Thomas as the only. So only three guys out of that stat. So it looks like most of the stats had around four. Four golfers that did finish inside the top ten. Uh, with the majority of them being, you know, I guess overlapping would be Bubba Watts and John Rahm, Cameron Smith and, and Justin Thomas. Um, that finished inside the top ten. Now, you could probably see a, a bunch on here if you're watching, pausing, and, and trying to figure it out. But really, maybe finding a core of those golfers is the best way to go. And maybe that is that is something to think about going forward. Um, I guess I don't really care to talk about green and reg. Although, when we look at green and reg, we do see four golfers inside the top 20. Proximity. Gotta go the other way. Um, one, two, three, four, five golfers. So maybe, you know, golfers who are doing well in recent form for like proximity green reg are worth considerations, perhaps. Uh, birdie or better, we only see three. So birdie or better was not really a stat to think about or to go with. Um, I don't really have anything else to add with any of this. Good drive percentage has six golfers inside the top 20. That's crazy. And by the way, these stats are from the 2021 season. So it's not looking at 2020 whatsoever. It's just looking at 2021. So good drive percentage worked out here. Um, we're not going to see this golf course again, most likely. It's going to be difficult to revert back to this uh, analysis and try to figure out how to play You know, this tournament once again or try to play. I don't think it's going to be the same for Zozo. But if we did see the Sherwood golf course being used once again i don't personally think unless it's a no cut and limited field i i'm not sure we can kind of revert back to to these results so i'm not positive one i, I do want to touch back up on looking at last week putting stats so if we look at last week we have all the stats available the best putters one two guys finished inside the top 10 so i was kind of wondering that that was one of those things that i thought actually would correlate you know doing well week in and week out is going from last week looking at their putting stats and comparing it to this week um but really it kind of just goes to show that the guys who did putt well last week it's it was just for that tournament. It was just for that golf course. Probably because they were reading those those greens pretty well. I don't think, yeah, I don't think putting travels well from week in, week out because we have different un undulating greens. We have different grasses, um, different pin positions. You know, some are tucked well behind bunkers where you have to hit shot shapes into them. So putting might be... You might have longer putts at certain courses versus others. And again, speed of the greens matter, slopes, that kind of thing. So yeah, putting is probably one of those that's a little bit difficult to go back and forth or, or to carry with you going forward. But how did off the tee do? Pretty good. And that makes sense. Um, for the listeners, what, we had one, two, three, four five six guys inside the top 10 with off the tee from last week how about tee to green one two three four five six with the winner also up there but with the winner his off the tee was good in fact all of these guys with tee to green that finished that are highlighted all had good off the tee stats so i think we're going to use that going into the next couple tournaments using off the tee metrics to try to figure out who's going into the next tournament with a little bit of confidence. The driver provides confidence. I'm telling you, I think everyone knows that, but it's good to, to kind of do this. So that was a fun hour. I'm not going to go any further than that. Um, I don't think I have anything to talk about, but that was fun going through. Uh, again, we messed up on the, on the bucket system. Should have just used last year's results because they matched out perfectly. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't, but we're going to learn. And this will be updated for next uh, next year's tournament. So we won't really use any of these stats here. Probably not worth it. 
um, since we've already proven that it didn't work. And again, for the listeners, that would be from the bucket system. That's not for what we just talked about. But yeah, looking at the top of the leaderboard, you know, Cantlay finished first. Now, Cantlay typically hits a draw, but he was working a fade pretty decently on Sunday. JT hits a fade. Rom hits a fade. Palmer hits a fade. Now, Bubba is interesting. He can shape in both directions, but he typically has issues hitting a draw, and that would be a right-hander's fade. Um, but I think he was he was shaping shots pretty well this this week. Henley hits a fade. Cameron Smith hits a fade. Cameron Champ hits a fade. Corey Connors hits a fade. Tony Finau hits a fade. A lot of these guys, their preferred shot shape is a fade. Really, the only person is Cantlay. That was kind of surprising. Cantlay and Watson, really. But, you know, when we think about the course fit, Strokes Gain Capping on Twitter said that he thinks a buttercut is the preferred flight. And sure enough, it looks like, you know, more holes had fades than not. And the ones that didn't matter, remember, we always have to, uh, rule of thumb is just play a fade if it doesn't matter. So we had way more fades the draws just weren't that important, honestly. Um, and it shows on the leaderboard. So that's the last little bit. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the review. And thank you for watching. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff. I'll see you probably just for a DK strategy video for the Bermuda Championship. So not going to do course fit, I don't think. And not going to do stat fit or recent form. It'll just straight be, uh, it'll only be strategy. So look forward to that on Tuesday and I'll see you then. All right, bye.